Thank you. Um, I'll try and give you a couple of other things that you can try and remember as well, actually. But um, uh, and thanks very much uh, for inviting us along. It's extremely, extremely interesting. Uh, listening to Jackson, some things I agree with entirely. Other things I disagree with, maybe not entirely, but quite a lot anyway. Um, <laughs> can I also just mention actually what Rose uh, was talking about earlier about Venezuela, um, and I think it's extremely important. Uh, that uh, we learn lessons from wherever they happen to be and whatever those lessons are going to be about then we should incorporate them as best we can in the circumstances that we have. So we're not the same as Venezuela in terms of the setup of the country or its, or its background or anything but what we are as, um, as a people who believe in this country, not everyone but the people in this room certainly and others outside who believe in a future where the people of the country have a great deal more to contribute and to gain from the running of that country. And uh, my colleague Sandra, uh, Sandra White, MSP, is out in Venezuela just now um, working as an election monitor. Um, as Jackson mentioned, I think it was Jackson mentioned that um, the, the dangers of uh, what is likely to happen in Venezuela if there's no outside um, sort of observation is clear for all um, who've actually heard about the manipulation of elections before. Uh, I'd also like to congratulate the Morning Star on uh, the launch of the edition, the new edition, which is going to make a, a significant impact, I believe, in the, in the debate in Scotland as we head towards the referendum in a couple of years' time. I mean, really, you know, we need to have a full range of views in the, <clears throat> in the press and the media, and we suffer from not having a full range of views. In fact, you can sit and uh, go through your 57 channels with nothing on. Uh, I don't mean you, with nothing on. Um, and actually, <laughs> and worry somewhat about the fact that um, the news, no matter who is presenting it, actually seems to be exactly the same um, from the same perspective. And we do need to have a different perspective, and I believe that the Morning Star uh, I suppose you could actually call it a real launch within Scotland actually will, will present um, us greatly with that. Uh, and the NUG are going to be having a fringe meeting at the Scottish National Party uh, conference in a couple of weeks' time. Um, and it's going to be centred around the Levison inquiry, um, amongst other things. But that will be certainly a, a major part <coughs> of it. And uh, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, John Swinney, is going to go along and uh, represent the government to speak about um, its views on uh, Levison and on the press and on press freedoms and on press rights actually because in spite of the fact that I might be in the parliament, I haven't always been in the parliament um, and I'm perfectly well aware uh, that what goes on behind uh, closed doors is a major, a major danger and that we do need to have the fourth estate, we need to have the press working there, we need to have the media uh, actually exposing when, and we don't need the tittle tattle, but we certainly need to proper examination of political, um, political presentation and how that actually affects people. So I think it's extremely important uh, that the Morning Star, as an example, uh, stands up and is read, um, uh, stands up for the, the future of the press in Scotland. Apart from anything else, there's an awful lot of jobs involved um, in the press and the media. And I think um, people should remember that uh, when we have these um, behind closed doors again within the media, unfortunately, um, press barons actually manipulating without uh, discussion uh, what's happening with staff and, uh, and the production values of the press, um, it ends up usually being that it's the reporters and the printers, um, other people, and the other people who work in these organisations who are the ones that actually suffer, as well as us suffering um, from having a reduced coverage of what's going on in the country. As far as democracy is concerned, because that actually links into democracy a great deal, as far as democracy is concerned, and that is uh, what we're actually talking about um, in the headline of, the, of this part of the conference, we're actually supposed to be looking at how we can have more influence on the democracy of our country, on the political machine in this country. And I think it's very, very important that what we look for and what we ensure that we look for is to widen the franchise. Uh, it's one of the benefits that's going to be coming from the announcements. I don't think it's breaking any rules because everybody knows now. Um, breaking, uh, 
right, and expanding the franchise in order to ensure 16 and 17 year olds a right to vote. Now I think um, 16 and 17 year olds, a lot of people will say they don't know anything, um, okay they're they're allowed to get married, allowed to join the army, but um, what do they really know about real life and what can they actually bring uh, to the political discourse of the country? Well, they can bring a huge amount to the political discourse of the country, because apart from anything else, the political discourse of the country affects them, so they actually have a view. They will have a view, and they've also got a right to therefore um, expound on those views. And the best way for them to be able to do that is to actually put pressure on those standing for election, um, they're by using their vote, um, use the opportunity to vote for who you think uh, will best represent your future. And uh, of course, from that point of view, um, we should actually have a, a proper electoral system which reflects those who are standing for election uh, much more um, honestly and openly and uh, much more democratically. If we've gone for a a single transferable vote, there'll be other different views and how that should actually be done, but the reality is that the system that we operate at the moment um, is partial and uh, doesn't really reflect the full views <coughs> of the country. I say that as somebody who's the chief whip for, uh, for the Scottish Government, so maybe I shouldn't be saying that, but the fact of the matter is that is the case. We really need to expand as much as possible to give as many people their right to have their view registered and I don't think that the electoral system that we're operating under just now actually does that. And it's something that we need to then do is guarantee um, that when people are uh, standing for election, when people are voting in elections, uh, that we have a guarantee that what is delivered is something which is going to be beneficial for as many people as possible in the country, hopefully for everybody, but certainly for as many people as possible and therefore a written constitution um, should be something and will be something um, if we if we have a yes vote in the referendum. It will be something which is instituted. Now there's been a whole lot of um, uh, campaigning over many many years from an awful lot of people, and I believe in this room as well that we do require a written constitution uh, with the rights of the people, with the rights of workers to be incorporated. One of the things that you'll maybe know now is, um, is, is that uh, both the Greens as well as the SNP and Alex Salmond has actually announced that um, within the written constitution, if they have the, the powers to actually do so in an independent Scotland, would be that Scotland would be a nuclear weapons free zone and that nuclear weapons would actually be illegal. Now, uh, what we need to do is make sure that uh, that is held to account and therefore it's a written constitution that's got to be incorporated in it and when that is incorporated in it it will be something that you can as a first minister prime minister whoever it happens to be taken to court uh, under if you break that rule if you break that constitutional uh, limit something which possibly should be considered in the international law of aggression um, in terms of uh, tony blair and uh, whether or not he should be uh, liable to be able to be brought to court for his behaviour uh, in terms of wars, of uh, illegal wars basically. And I'm trying to be careful in what I say because um, I don't really care what Tony Blair actually thinks, but I'm trying to be careful what I say because I do think that we, we are going to have to look, we are going to have to look uh, seriously at how we can ensure that a written constitution comes about which actually delivers for the people. Getting rid of nuclear weapons in a written constitution is something which I fully believe in. I also believe that illegal wars um, should bring you into conflict with a written constitution and I would actually like to see that incorporated into it as well. Although at the moment that is not actually being suggested. There are people who are, uh, who are pressing for that to take place. I think, um, you know, we're talking about here though in particular today, we're talking about the rights of workers in Scotland and, and the rights of workers in Scotland are very little better than what they were um, before devolution. Um, you know, we've still got the same anti-trade union laws, um, we've still got uh, privatisation on the railways, we still um, have uh, deregulation of the buses, I think um, these, are, these are major issues which I think we have to actually uh, look seriously at and I do know that um, the present uh, Transport Minister has been looking again at the possibility of renationalising the railways when the powers are there 
Um, that's a suggestion of something which couldn't be done until the powers were actually in the Scottish Parliament, but at least the suggestion is there, and that there will have to be and are going to be a build-up of policy from across the board from people who are going to say what they are suggesting Scotland should be like following the referendum, however the result goes. It's on the part of those who believe in independence to have to put forward a vision, an achievable vision, but a vision which actually is beneficial to the people of Scotland. It's also incumbent on those who are on the other side of the argument who actually then have to say, well, if you don't get independence, what else are you got? What are we going to do? How are you? How are you, your life going to change? Why should you vote no to this? Because if you're going to have an opportunity to actually put your voice forward to suggest that there should be something better or something different after independence, if you achieve it, then the people who are saying that no, they don't want independence are going to have to put something forward. Arthur Midwinter, uh, <clears throat> who is on the commission that's been established uh, by Joanne Lamont, has actually said that he doesn't believe uh, that there should be more powers for the Scottish uh, <coughs> Parliament under devolution. He says the alternative is either the present status quo of the devolved Parliament or its independence and that there's nothing in between. Now, that's an argument which he's going to have to, uh, he's going to, have to take forward through the commission uh, that Labour has set up and, and, and that will have to be debated and quite right, people will get different points of view. But it is a point of view that a significant figure has actually brought forward and I sort of feel a bit sorry and people will probably laugh uh, and say I so you did when I say that I feel, I feel a bit sorry for Joanne Lamont actually because she's presented something, she's presented a position and she's been pulled from one side to the other, not by not by the SNP or by the Yes campaign, but by her own side. Because once you open up these arguments, then you are going to have people disagreeing with you within your own camp. And then you have to have a, if, you, if it's a commission, if it's a commission, then it should be listening to all sides and coming out with something at the end. And the reason I feel sorry for, for what she, the situation that she's in is because if she doesn't <coughs> through, um, come out very strongly with her, with an exact position just now, then she'll be seen as being weak. But if you set up a, up a commission that has to examine things, then you have to give it time to actually do its examining, you know? Now, I don't happen to think a commission is, is worth tuppence, but that's not, that's my opinion. Her opinion is that it is, and she should, I think, be given the opportunity um, to allow it to, to work its way. <coughs> In terms of uh, trade union members, as, uh, <clears throat> as was mentioned by Jackson there, actually. He's quite right, of course. Um, there is not a, any, in, amongst any class or, <coughs> a, or membership of any organisation other than the SNP and the Greens, maybe, um, which actually believe in majority of, uh, for independence. However, 53%, um, according to the figures that I saw, of trade union members in the election in 2011 voted SNP. So on that basis, I think it's important that the trade unions should recognise that fact, but at the same time it's important that the SNP should recognise the fact that so many trade unionists who've got concerns over workers' rights and over uh, how industry is developed in this country, the SNP will have to actually look then at representing those workers to the best of its ability. And uh, yes, there are elements of um, presentation of policy, which I think eh, probably fall down on that and therefore have to be rethought and readdressed because you cannot have, um, you cannot have a, the, the continued support and belief of a, section, a huge section of society unless you do something to represent them on the basis of one of the most important elements eh, within their, eh, within their eh, daily lives and that will be about their jobs and about their wages and conditions and about those of their fellow workers. So I think that's, a, that's something that has to be addressed all round. I think it's extremely important. However, if we want to have democracy and if what we're actually talking about, um, whether it's an independent Scotland or a devolved Scotland, is we want to have democracy, we're going to have to ensure that as much democracy as possible can be brought. And I think that's pretty much an argument most people in here would believe. We have to ensure that as much democracy as possible is brought to the Scottish Parliament. Powers 
I want to see the full powers of an independent Scotland, the same as any other country in the world. Um, certainly not against anybody from any other country, which includes England, uh, having uh, the rights of uh, developing itself in terms of being a democratic nation. And that's, a, that's an issue that we all have to struggle with. How does democracy, how is it delivered? What actually counts as democracy? Is it getting what we want or is it getting what benefits the majority of people? Um, that's, what we have to, that's what we have to look at. And I don't think that under the, the devolved situation that the Scottish Parliament really um, can actually take democracy a very great deal further. It can have extra powers, but if its democracy is constrained by an authority outside, if it's constrained by Westminster, then I don't believe that democracy will be fully served under that circumstance. Therefore, I do think that um, by looking at the fact that we have to look at repeal of the anti-trade union laws, which <coughs> Westminster, um, no matter who's been in power, doesn't really seem to have been top of the agenda, um, and we, we can actually do what the Scottish Government has done and recognise International Workers' Day, um, which actually therefore is mapped now in the Scottish Parliament and in, build and in uh, public buildings around Scotland, which it wasn't before. Uh, we have uh, I've frequently now addressed uh, Scottish hazards in terms of health and safety issues in Scotland, as was mentioned by Jackson. The disgraceful uh, record of health and safety in Scotland really, really has to be looked at very seriously and the powers to do so should be brought here because this is where we really need the powers since we suffer more greatly than any other part of the UK uh, under, under these uh, difficulties. So I'm just going to finish off um, by saying that as far as um, the Scottish Government is concerned, um, I don't think that we would have wanted um, ATOS to have been making the decisions that they've been making um, in terms of people who are uh, going for benefit claims and, and having to actually have themselves assessed by, by doctors who are given a quota that they have to actually reject uh, and therefore reject people on all sorts of spurious issue, um, range of issues. I don't think that we would have done that. However, I do think that if we had an independent Scottish Government, an independent Scottish Parliament, then the Scottish Government, whoever it was, would actually be much more open to the pressure of the people in this room, of the people outside this room in Scotland, and of the electorate of Scotland. We don't have the powers in this country to challenge the coalition at Westminster. We should have, we should get rid of the Westminster layer of government, and we should take control of the power of democracy in this country. Thank you. Okay, so that's starting to set out the variety of opinions.